Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for being with us at uh, uh, slightly later hour than usual uh, if you're in India. Um, but uh, I think uh, you'll all agree that it's worth it because today we get to hear from a philosopher whose work I'm sure many of us have been following with uh, great interest and admiration, and that is uh, uh, Professor Jim Woodward uh, from the History and Philosophy of Science Department at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, as I'm sure I don't need to uh, uh, mention, but I'm sure most of you know this, uh, Professor Woodward has done really seminal work on causation, uh, especially the interventionist account of causation, which he has really developed into uh, a in quite influential and refined theory of causation. Um, and uh, today we're going to hear from him about uh, downward causation. Um, and uh, so yeah, uh, the, we'll go for about 45 minutes uh, to an hour, depending on how long uh, Professor Woodward uh, wants to go. And then after that, I'll open the floor up to questions. Um, and I'll hand it over now to Professor Woodward. Thank you very much for being with us. Well, thank you very much for um, inviting me. Um, I'm going to go through a, a bunch of slides, but if you have questions, uh, don't um, be, you should feel free to uh, interrupt me. Uh, at any point, if you uh, if there's anything that's unclear or anything you want to want to ask about, so th this is a talk on causal complexity, conditional independence, and uh, downward uh, downward causation. And the reason why I put these things, these different topics together, is that I see um, talk of, of downward causation as one strategy. Uh, for dealing with uh, causal complexity, not the only possible strategy, uh, but certainly um, an important one. Um, causal complexity, uh, what I mean by that is, is simply a system that has a, uh, a very complicated uh, causal structure. And what you're looking for are handles that will in some way allow you to uh, simplify the structure. Uh, so it's very much a matter of finding uh, strategies to work with systems uh, that um, if we were to kind of track every feature of the causal interactions of the system, it would just be uh, overwhelmingly uh, complex. And I'm going to talk uh, in connection with uh, downward causation with another notion that I call uh, conditional independence, which I claim is uh, central uh, to uh, understanding how downward causation works. So part of what I'm going to be doing is providing the defense of legitimacy of uh, talk of downward causation. Now, downward causation, as you probably know, uh, is a controversial topic, uh, both within philosophy of science and also uh, within um, science more generally. A number of people, including a number of philosophers of science, have claimed that the whole notion of downward causation is incoherent. Uh, I think that they're wrong, that we can make sense of the notion of downward causation. Um, what do I mean by downward causation? Well, roughly the idea that the cause is at a different and higher level uh, uh, than the effect. I'll give you some examples shortly. Um, I'm not going to try to tell you what a level is. I'm going to uh, rely on an intuitive uh, understanding of, uh, uh, of the things being at different levels. But for example, um, suppose that uh, here's a here's a here's what here's an example of downward causation. Um, the um, position of a uh, chimpanzee uh, within a uh, social hierarchy within a uh, within a band um, influences the uh, serotonin levels uh, uh, that are in the animal. So, um, if an animal is at a relatively high level in the hierarchy, then uh, the uh, serotonin levels are uh, correspondingly high. And in fact, you can manipulate uh, the position of a chimpanzee within a hierarchy, say by taking it from one band and putting it in another band. And if um, the result of this is that the animal that's moved is at a lower level in the hierarchy, you'll see the serotonin levels plummet. So one thinks about the position in the hierarchy as something that's at a relatively high level serotonin level uh, relatively low. Uh, so this is, if there's, it would really make sense to talk about a causal influence of position in the hierarchy on serotonin levels, this would be a case of downward causation. Okay, so let me say a little bit, first of all, about uh, causation in general. 
I'm going to assume a, a so-called interventionist account of causation that I've uh, uh, defended elsewhere. Um, I hope it seems kind of uh, commonsensical, uh, the idea is that X causes Y, and when there's some possible intervention that changes the value of X, and along with this, there's an associated regular change uh, in the value of Y. That's the general idea of, um, a, um, that, uh, of a, a, a causal relation, roughly if you can intervene to manipulate X and Y changes in a regular way in response, then there's a causal relationship between X and Y. And when X is at a higher level than Y, and this pattern of dependency between X and Y holds, then we've got downward causation. Now, the notion of an intervention is crucial uh, to this uh, uh, sort of framework. It's a notion that I've discussed uh, elsewhere. Um, it's also a notion that figures prominently in other work, other recent work on uh, causation and causal inference, including uh, work by Pearl and work by uh, Sperdy's uh, Gleamler Shinas and others uh, at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Um, and so the basic idea here is that we want uh, to capture the idea of a manipulation of a variable X with respect to a second variable Y, where the change in X that results from the manipulation occurs only, th excuse me, the change in Y, if any, that uh, occurs as a result of the manipulation occurs only through X and, and not in some other way. So basically what we want is something like an unconfounded uh, manipulation of X uh, with respect to Y. So for example, in the structure that I have here at uh, the bottom of the slide, um, this would not count as uh, an intervention on um, uh, X with respect to Y because uh, the, the, uh, the intervention or the manipulation uh, affects Y via a second path, the path through Z, uh, that doesn't go through X. So uh, here, the influence, uh, if any, of X on Y is confounded by um, uh, the, uh, uh, the influence of Z. Z, Z is uh, often in this kind of situation referred to as an off-path variable. And we don't want uh, the intervention to affect Y via some uh, variable that is off path in the sense of involving a path that doesn't go through X. So we're assuming that, um, uh, that, that that's how we're to understand an intervention. Um, uh, think about a, um, um, an unconfounded experiment um, or think about say a randomized experiment uh, trying to determine say whether a drug uh, promotes recovery from an illness. Um, if the randomization in the experiment is done properly, it's going to satisfy these conditions for uh, uh, an intervention. Now, the notion of uh, downward causation uh, has actually been getting um, a fair amount of attention recently in the scientific literature and not just in, in uh, philosophy of science. So, uh, George Ellis, who's a very eminent uh, astrophysicist, um, among other achievements, um, he's the uh, author of, uh, uh, along with uh, Stephen Hawking, of the large-scale structure of uh, space-time. Uh, he's relatively recently uh, published a book with the slightly wacky-sounding title of How Can Physics Underlie the Mind? Top-Down Causation on the Human Context. Um, this, despite the uh, slightly, I don't know what, odd title, um, this is actually a very interesting book. And it's full of uh, a lot of plausible examples of uh, downward causation. And here's uh, what Ellis says in general. Uh, this is what its test is for uh, downward causation. One demonstrates the existence of top-down causation whenever manipulating a high-level variable can be shown to reliably change low-level variables. So this is basically just an interventionist uh, conception of causation of the sort that I was just describing applied to uh, the case of downward causation. Um, so I want to say a little bit more about how we're to understand um, the notion of uh, an intervention, how that works 
in a context in which we have variables at different levels. Uh, this is something that um, I at least haven't talked very much about in, in, until uh, I've done this uh, relatively recent work that I'm describing um, uh, today. So we're going to assume a, a kind of sort of oversimplified setup, but I think it will um, uh, suffice to get the main ideas across. Um, so we're going to be assuming a situation in which we have an upper level variable, uh, U, which uh, supervenes on or is realized by this kind of standard philosophical language here, uh, by some lower level variables, um, L. Okay, so think, for example, of a, maybe a, um, a psychological variable like a, like a belief or a desire. It's realized by um, maybe some lower level uh, neuro, neurobiological variables. Or think about a variable like temperature, uh, which is realized by some very complicated uh, profile of uh, molecular um, motions. Um, when you intervene on an upper level variable, uh, of course, you're going to change the lower level variables that are the supervenience base for the upper level variable. So when you intervene on the upper level variable, you're going to, of course, change the lower level variables that uh, realize it. If you um, have a gas in the container and you put the uh, container into a heat bath and you change the temperature of the gas in that way, then of course uh, you're going to change the mean kinetic energy of the molecules uh, that make up the, the gas. So one consequence of this is that um, we don't require that an intervention on an upper level variable leave the lower level variables that serve as its supervenience base unchanged. Uh, we're in effect assuming that this is impossible. You can't um, intervene on temperature and change it while leaving um, the um, underlying um, uh, uh, molecular variables completely, completely unchanged. Um, this might seem obvious, uh, but there are people within uh, the literature uh, who deny that this is a reasonable requirement. I'm thinking particularly of uh, uh, Michael Baumgartner but, uh, here, but other people have had a similar uh, 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 view. Um, so here, the, put it a little bit differently, the requirement that an intervention on an upper level variable U1 with respect to a second variable U2 not affect U2 via a causal path that doesn't go through U1 is understood in such a way that the variables on which U1 uh, supervenes are not treated as off-path variables. They're not treated as potential confounders of the U1 to U2. Uh, relationship. So remember that we wanted uh, in characterizing um, the notion of an intervention uh, to exclude the possibility that um, uh, the putative um, uh, effect is uh, influenced by uh, via some uh, off path variable that doesn't go through uh, the putative cause. But what I'm saying is we don't treat supervenience bases or realization relations as off-path variables for the uh, purpose of uh, 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 applying this idea. So here it's a little bit of a diagram. Um, suppose that the um, vertical arrows in blue uh, represent supervenience relations. The uh, horizontal area arrow from L1 to L2 uh, represents uh, 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 a causal relation, and what I'm saying here, and so L1 is the realizer of U1, L2 is the realizer of U2, and what I'm saying is that L1 and L2 are not treated as off-path variables for the purposes of characterizing an intervention on U1 with respect to U2. So here, so that's one requirement about how we should think about um, interventions and in contexts in which we have variables at different levels. Um, here is another uh, requirement which uh, I think is implicit in what um, uh, Ellis just said in the, in, the, in the passage that I quoted and I think also makes uh, a good deal of sense. Uh, the idea is that in cases in which um, 
um, a variable u can be multiply realized by a bunch of different lower level variables, we require that an intervention on the upper level variable that sets that upper level variable to some value have an uniform or approximately uniform effect on the uh, target uh, uh, variable y for all realizations of the uh, values of the upper level variable. And the intent here is to exclude so-called ambiguous manipulations in which the effect of um, some upper level variable on some second variable y depends on the details of how um, uh, the upper level variable is realized. Um, so to use language I've used elsewhere, downward causes should be uh, realization independent. It shouldn't matter. The, the, the um, downward cause should have the same effect um, under a man manipulation uh, independently of the details of how the um, downward cause is realized. Um, so what does this exclude? Well, here's a, a, um, uh, an illustration that uh, comes from, um, uh, I guess that's Peter Spurdy's and uh, Richard Shinas at Carnegie Mellon. Um, think about the um, effect of total cholesterol on uh, heart health. And let's just suppose, uh, for the sake of argument, that total cholesterol is the sum of two other quantities, uh, low density cholesterol and high density cholesterol. So total cholesterol is just the arithmetic sum of your LDL value and your HDL value. Now, as it happens, um, HDL and LDL have quite different effects on uh, heart health. Um, high density cholesterol is actually beneficial uh, for heart health and low density cholesterol is actually damaging to heart health. So if you think about a manipulation of total cholesterol, its effects on heart health are gonna depend upon the pr precise mix of um, HDL and LDL that is in that total cholesterol variable. If uh, someone has, uh, if you're thinking about a manipulation in which uh, most of the value of the total cholesterol variable is due to a high value of LDL and only a little bit of that is due to a high value of HDL, then that's gonna have a bad effect on heart health. If things are reversed and the realization of the total cholesterol variable uh, contains a, a very high value for LDL and a very low value for HDL, then it's gonna have a beneficial effect. So that would be a case of an ambiguous manipulation. The effect of manipulating total cholesterol on uh, heart health depends upon the details of the way in which the total cholesterol variable is realized. And what I'm saying is we want to exclude that uh, uh, to have a well-defined notion of downward causation. Um, in the case of temperature, for example, if I um, manipulate the temperature of a gas, say by putting it in a heat bath or um, um, exposing it to a flame or something like that, the um, effect of changing the temperature on other thermodynamic variables like pressure uh, is not going to depend upon the way in which the temperature value variable is realized at a lower level. Uh, as long as I've increased the temperature by uh, X degrees, uh, it's going to have the same effect on um, pressure independently independently of the exact molecular details by which the change in um, temperature is realized. So that would be a case in which uh, you have realization uh, uh, independence, uh, and that's one of my conditions for an upper level cause to be uh, causally efficacious. Okay. Um, so this requirement of uniformity of effect, or you might call it homogeneity of effect, is um, uh, closely connected to uh, an idea that I'm going to call conditional independence uh, that I mentioned earlier, and I'll, I'll try to spell out later on in the talk. Now, here's another um, uh, condition that I think um, causation in general 
uh, needs to satisfy, not just downward causation, but any well-defined uh, notion of causation. Uh, and that is that you, we need to think of causal relations as relations uh, among uh, variables, or being a little floppy here, whatever in the world uh, corresponds to variables. One of the marks of a variable is that it can take different values. So examples of variables are things like mass, temperature, current, uh, 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 et cetera. An object, the same object, an object can have uh, a number of different values for its mass, a uh, number of different values for its temperature. So mass and temperature are variables. And an important idea here, um, which I'll say more about later, is at least from an interventionist point of view, it's only variables that can stand in causal relationships. We haven't clearly specified what causal relationships we're talking about until we have specified the variables that are involved. So to anticipate discussion below, um, when we're talking about things, not variables, but things like a cell membrane, I'll give you an example involving this shortly, um, these are not the sorts of things that can stand in causal relations, uh, at least from an interventionist uh, uh, point of view. And this fact, which might seem a little about only variables standing in causal relations, which might seem a little bit pedantic, uh, turns out, in fact, to be crucial to understanding downward causation and uh, replying to some of the objections uh, that people have had uh, to the notion. Um, I don't claim that the conditions that I've just described are sufficient for the presence of downward causation. I'm guessing uh, maybe that they're not, but I'm at least going to assume that they're uh, necessary in what follows. Okay, so downward causation, there are lots of uh, uh, examples, I think, in the scientific literature. I gave you a biological um, uh, example. Um, another set of biological examples are uh, epigenetic effects, when uh, stuff that goes on in the environment um, uh, influences gene expression. If you think that the environment, and variables characterizes, characterizing an environment are a higher level than uh, uh, variables characterizing gene expression, you've got a case of downward causation here. But I'm gonna focus on just one example, and this is the Hodgkin-Huxley model of the action potential. And what this does is it describes the factors causally affecting uh, the action potential uh, within an individual uh, uh, neuron. Um, so this is work that Hodgkin and Huxley won uh, the Nobel Prize for. It's um, uh, very, very um, uh, uh, influential work. I won't go into a whole lot of detail. The model itself uh, involves uh, a set of uh, coupled uh, differential equations. But the basic idea of the model is you can understand uh, the, um, the neuron and the generation of the action potential uh, in terms, I think of it as a circuit uh, in parallel, a parallel circuit that is, as opposed to a circuit in series. Uh, there's a capacitor uh, which stores charge. Um, this is the potential difference across the neuronal membrane, which functions as a capacitor. And then there are various um, channels, ion channels in the neuron itself. Um, there's a channel, actually there's a whole bunch of them, but you can treat this as just one channel, a channel that conducts a sodium current um, uh, across the uh, membrane. Um, and it's important that this um, uh, channel is a, um, a voltage, it's, it has a voltage dependent conductance. That is the conductance or the resistance of the channel, conductance and resistance are just reciprocals to one another. Uh, the conductance of the channel varies uh, depending upon the um, uh, voltage across the whole membrane. So there's a sodium current channel, uh, there's a separate um, channel that conducts a potassium current, also time and voltage um, uh, uh, dependent. And then there's a, a third channel, a so-called uh, uh, leakage uh, channel, also assumed to be time and that should be dependent there rather than independent. Um, so here's the basic uh, uh, idea. Um, 
the so we have these conductances or resistances that um, uh, characterize uh, the rate at which current is flowing through these various ion channels, the sodium channel, the potential, the potassium channel, uh, and so on and so forth. And as I said a moment ago, these um, conductances are in turn functions of, that is, they're causally influenced by the potential difference across the membrane. So the rate at which the channels conduct ionic currents depends upon the voltage across the membrane on uh, other fact, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, it depends on that among, uh, among other, other factors. Um, so note that the, um, um, the um, ion channels here, the potassium and um, sodium ion channels, they're part of the cell membrane. They're physically in the, in, in the cell uh, uh, membrane. They're embedded in the membrane. Um, and the behavior of the channels, as we've just said, is influenced by the potential difference across the membrane. Um, so this is what makes this look like a plausible case of downward causation. Uh, the thought is that the membrane as a whole uh, is at a higher level than the individual ion channels. It's much bigger. Uh, indeed, the ion channels are part of the um, uh, cell membrane, uh, but not unless you have the <coughs> voltage across the whole membrane um, uh, influencing uh, the ion channels. And this is what makes the whole thing look like a plausible case of downward causation. And indeed, that's the way it's described uh, by, for example, Dennis Noble in uh, a uh, wonderful little book that he wrote called The Music of Life. Uh, Noble is another uh, prominent scientist who has recently uh, been uh, defending uh, the notion of uh, uh, downward causation, and this is one of his central examples of, uh, of uh, downward causation. Okay. So, as I said earlier, the Hodgkin-Huxley model looks like a legitimate, intelligible uh, representation of what's apparently a case of downward causation. Uh, so what's going on here? Uh, why would anyone think that there's anything fishy or funny or unintelligible uh, uh, about this, uh, as indeed people have? Well, critics have had many reasons for objecting to the idea of downward causation. But one of their primary objections is that downward causation involves a whole acting downwards on its parts. And this is thought to be inconsistent with the requirement that cause and effect be suitably distinct from one another. So I'll say more about this in a minute, but a, a standard assumption, uh, which I actually think is correct and defensible, is that when you have a relationship between cause and effect, the cause and the effect have to be in some way uh, uh, distinct from one another. So um, to use uh, David Lewis's example, um, if someone says hello loudly, uh, you wouldn't think that that person saying hello uh, causes uh, the person saying hello loudly or vice versa. Saying hello and saying hello loudly are not distinct from one another in the right way that they can stand in a causal relationship. And what the critics are saying is that whenever you have um, causation from a whole to a part, um, you have a failure of this requirement that the causal relata be distinct, and that's why ca um, ca uh, downward causation doesn't make any sense. Now, I agree, in fact, that hold apart uh, causation, at least in many cases, is incoherent. However, this is not what's going on in plausible examples of downward causation, uh, including uh, uh, what's going on in the uh, Hodgkin-Huxley uh, model. So what I'm basically arguing here, here is that the critics are right uh, to say that, um, at least in a lot of cases, hold the part causation, where the, the part is a part of the whole, um, doesn't make any sense. Um, but it would be, it's a mistake to think that that's what the causal relationships look like in examples like Hodgkin-Huxley model or 
uh, standard other examples of uh, downward causation. So here's a basic observation. Suppose that P is some spatial or temporal part of a whole W. Let X be some variable that characterizes features of the whole W, Y some variable that characterizes some feature of the part P. Then it's entirely possible for the variables X and Y to be distinct in a way that allows for X to cause Y despite the parthood relationship between P and W. So this goes back to the point I made earlier that um, causal relationships, at least within an interventionist framework, are always between variables. Uh, they're not between things. So one reason from my point of view uh, why it, the, the notion of a whole causing a part doesn't make any sense is wholes and parts are things. They're not the right sort of stuff to uh, stand in uh, uh, causal relationships. But what you can have is the situation where you a variable characterizing a whole um, uh, causally influences a variable characterizing a part of that whole. And that can make perfectly good sense. The variables there uh, can be distinct um, uh, in a way that allows them to stand in a causal relationship. Um, so let's go back to the Hodgkin-Huxley model. Um, the ionic channels are certainly parts, physical parts of the uh, membrane, but that doesn't mean that the conductance variables are um, parts or constituents of the variable V that characterizes the potential difference across the membrane. And the variable V and the conductances don't seem to exhibit the kind of failure of distinctness uh, that we think uh, gets in the way of variables standing in a causal relationship. So um, in other words, what I'm saying is the relationship between the variable V and the ionic uh, conductances, uh, where V is uh, arguably a cause of changes in those conductances, it isn't like the relationship between saying hello and saying hello loudly. It isn't like the relationship between uh, uh, a whole and a part. So in the case of the Hodgkin-Huxley model, the question we want to ask ourselves uh, is whether the voltage across the membrane, that's our candidate for the top-down cause, uh, and the channel conductances, these are our candidates for the effect, um, are, are these variables distinct in a way that allows them to stand in causal relationships? Okay, so that requires that we have a test for when variables are distinct. Um, this is a, um, a test that I've defended elsewhere. I call it uh, independent fixability. Um, I think it's implicit um, whenever you use um, uh, things like directed graphs or um, structural equations to model causal relationships, which is, uh, of course, the thing that I do in my book and that uh, uh, Pearl and other people do. Um, the idea is that when you have um, a directed graph with um, uh, describing causal relationships between variables or you have a, a set of structural equations, then you, you, you assume that the following condition is met, um, that it's possible to set each variable um, in the set of variables that you're working with to each of its possible values via an intervention while also setting any other variable in the variable set uh, uh, to each of its possible values by an intervention. And I call this the condition of uh, independent um, fi fixability. Um, so the question that we want to ask is, uh, are the variables that figure in the Hodgkin-Huxley model suitably distinct according to this condition that I just described, independent fixability? Um, does that condition imply that the variables in the Hodgkin-Huxley model are suitably distinct such that they can stand in a causal relationship? Um, I think the answer to this question is clearly yes. Uh, you don't have to get entangled in complicated questions about what is or is impossible. Um, the, first of all, the variable V is clearly manipulable in a way that is independent of the values taken by the 
conductances. Um, why is this? Well, it, it's shown, it, it, this is shown to be true uh, by the very experiments that uh, Hodgkin and Huxley did uh, to um, uh, establish the uh, uh, Hodgkin-Huxley model. Uh, what they did was they uh, made use of a newly invented device called a voltage clamp. That should be clamp, not camp. Um, and basically what the voltage clamp allowed you to do was to uh, clamp the voltage across the membrane at various values um, in a way that depended only on the clamp and nothing else. In other words, the clamp functioned as an intervention device. You could fix the membrane difference just via the clamp, and then you could track what the um, uh, result of that setting the membrane potential difference to one value rather than another, what the result of that would be on the behavior of the uh, uh, ion channels. And so what this allows you to do is to uh, uh, isolate uh, the effect of the voltage on the ionic currents. Uh, and when this is done, it in fact uh, confirms the uh, predictions of the Hodgkin-Huxley model. So we can manipulate V uh, independently of the ionic currents. And although Hodgkin and Huxley were not able to actually experimentally do this in their experiment, um, it is certainly now uh, possible to manipulate the individual ionic channels uh, in a way that's independent of the voltage across the membrane. So there are molecular or, or uh, pharmaceutical interventions uh, that allow you to change the, um, uh, the behavior of the, of the channels and the conductances of the channels independently of the voltage across the membrane. So this shows that the um, independent fixability uh, requirement is satisfied. It shows you that V and uh, the ionic currents uh, and conductances are sufficiently distinct that they can stand in uh, uh, causal relationships. So the basic point here is that um, typical cases of, at least a lot of cases of top-down causation, um, they do involve uh, cases in which you have variables, they're predicated of holes, uh, they causally affect variables that are predicated of parts of those holes. But this is okay um, as long as the variables are sufficiently distinct uh, to stand in causal relationships. It doesn't matter if um, the uh, variables are predicated of holes and parts and the holes and parts aren't distinct in the right way. What matters is whether the variables are distinct in the right way. Okay, uh, there's more that might be said about um, downward causation. Uh, one feature of the Hodgkin-Huxley model and many other cases of downward causation, uh, not all of them, but many, is that uh, there are causal cycles uh, present. Uh, that is, uh, you have cases in which one variable, variable V, uh, influences another variable I, say the conductances, and then the conductances themselves uh, influence V. So in the case of the uh, Hodgkin-Huxley model, uh, on the one hand, um, changes in the voltage across the membrane uh, influences the currents through the membrane, but as the currents through the membrane change, uh, they uh, change uh, the voltage. Um, Again, uh, there's nothing, uh, from my point of view, uh, 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 objectionable about this. Lots of uh, uh, biological phenomena uh, involve uh, 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 cycles of this kind. Uh, maybe we can talk more about this in the uh, uh, Q&A. Uh, okay, so here's a possible objection, though, to what I just said. And the objection is that this really doesn't get to the heart of the matter, metaphysically speaking. This is the response of a certain kind of metaphysician. Uh, the objector says this, look, in the case of the Hodgkin-Huxley model, the, neur the neuron is, of course, composed of atoms and molecules. Um, these interact locally at a very fine-grained level, mainly through uh, the electromagnetic forces. And so the membrane potential, the potential across the whole membrane, um, has to be the upshot or the result of, of complex patterns of interaction 
among these fine-grained atomic and molecular constituents. These variables don't represent something over and above uh, the uh, actions of the constituents. So why did, then do we need to make the, any use of the notion of downward causation from upper level variables? All that's really going on, it might be argued, involves causal interactions among lower level variables. Talk of downward causation seems super, superfluous. You know, maybe it's just um, uh, something like a, a, a kind, of, kind of manner of speaking or something like that, but it doesn't capture what's really going on. Uh, at lower levels. So here's my response. And here uh, I'm going to make use of this idea of conditional independence that I um, alluded to uh, earlier. Uh, my response is that we can legitimately use upper level variables, use rather than lower level variables else, to account for some effect variable E when, and here's the conditional independence idea, which is going to sound kind of complicated, but I hope that it um, uh, makes intuitive uh, sense. I'll try to uh, explain it in a way that makes it intuitive. Um, when conditional on the values of the upper level variables, further variations in the lower level variables make no difference to the effect variable we're trying to explain. And the intuition here is that when this condition is satisfied, um, the impact of the lower level variables can be entirely absorbed uh, by the upper level variables. So you just need the uh, upper level variables. You don't need the lower level variables. And I suggest that this is what's going on in the Hodgkin-Huxley model as an empirical matter, at least if you believe the model, uh, given the value of the membrane potential V, further lower level detail of a sort that might be captured by lower level variables is conditionally irrelevant to what we're trying to explain, which is the shape of the action potential. And in that sort of case, we can use the upper level variable rather than uh, uh, the lower level variables. So here's um, a, a kind of more general way of thinking about this. Um, you can, at least in many cases in which we're dealing with so-called upper level variables, uh, we can think of them as a sort of coarse graining of the lower level variables. The lower level variables have very high dimensionality, um, many, many degrees of freedom. So if you're thinking about a, a gas, for example, and you're thinking about the relationship between temperature and um, the uh, molecular motions that realize a particular value um, uh, uh, for temperature on some particular uh, uh, occasion, uh, there's going to be a huge number of molecules in the gas. Um, each molecule, uh, we might suppose, um, can be characterized in terms of six variables corresponding to the three dimensions of um, position uh, for the molecule and three dimensions of its um, momentum. So you have an enormous number of degrees of freedom uh, if you're talking about a mole of gas. Um, and uh, this very enormous number of degrees of freedom uh, are kind of collapsed or replaced uh, when you um, substitute an upper level variable like temperature uh, for the lower level variable. But the idea is you can do this in such a way that the values of the upper level variable still capture everything that makes a difference for the lower level variable. Um, so all of the difference making properties of um, the lower level variables are, so to speak, absorbed uh, into the upper level variables. So here's uh, an attempt to make this uh, a little bit more um, uh, uh, precise. Um, I won't bother to read it, but again, the, the basic idea is you've got lower level variables L, upper level variables U, some explanandum or effect of interest uh, e, and the idea is that conditional on the values of the upper level variables, further variation in the lower level variables that are, that are consistent with the values of the upper level variables makes no additional difference to um, the value of the effect variable uh, that we're trying to explain. And I say that under in these sorts of circumstances, uh, you've got um, 
uh, conditional uh, independence of the um, or conditional irrelevance of the lower level variables to the effect variable E conditional on um, the upper level variables. Um, so you can think of this as a kind of screening off relation um, where um, the um, U's screen off the L's uh, from E, but screening off here is not understood uh, as it usually is in probability theory in terms of um, statistical conditional uh, uh, independence. Rather, it's a screening off condition that is characterized in terms of what happens under interventions. If you fix the values of the U's at some value via interventions and then you wiggle via independent interventions the values of the L's, this makes no additional difference to uh, the values of the E's. Okay, so I'm saying that when you have that kind of condition satisfied, then you can uh, talk um, in an acceptable way about um, uh, downward, downward, downward causation. The condition just described corresponds to complete realization independence of the uh, upper level variable uh, on the um, uh, uh, effect of interest. You may recall that I began the talk by talking by saying that when you had um, downward causation, you needed some amount of uh, conditional of uh, uh, realization uh, 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 independence. Um, so you can think of this complete irrelevance to the lower level variables, conditional on the upper level variables, as a kind of limiting case. Although, in fact, I think it's not nearly as rare. Uh, as many philosophers suppose. I think there are lots of biological examples in which this condition is pretty much completely satisfied. But you might take the notion of, of, of the requirement of complete irrelevance of the lower level variables and you might explore uh, how it might relax, might be relaxed in various ways. So one possibility is that although there may be rare or exceptional values of the lower level variables that are conditionally relevant to the effect of interest, even given the values of the upper level variables, uh, this may not be true for most or almost all values of the L's. It might be the case that for most or almost all such values, the values of the L's are conditionally independent um, of E given you, even if there are a few values of L uh, for which this isn't true. Or you might, uh, another possibility for relaxing this condition, um, you might say that con suppose the conditional irrelevance holds for all values of L and U within a certain large interval, including perhaps values that are most likely to occur, uh, at least around here uh, uh, and right now. Or you might suppose the conditional irrelevance or something close to it holds on some scales, typically coarser ones, uh, but not on other perhaps more fine grain. Uh, 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 scales. And there are various ways of trying to measure uh, something like a degree of um, conditional irrelevance that, um, uh, um, that, that one might try to develop. Um, I won't go into this. There are in the uh, computer science literature uh, what are in effect um, ways of um, trying to make this uh, kind of more quantitatively uh, uh, effect. Okay, so, so just to reiterate the basic idea here, um, if you can find a set of upper level variables that satisfy this conditional independence relation, then you can replace the lower level variables with the upper level variables insofar as you're interested in just um, identifying uh, difference making relationships bearing on the effect of interest. Um, so in other words, the U do just as good a job as the L uh, with respect to identifying difference-making um, uh, relationships. And since identifying difference-making relationships is what explanation and causal analysis is all about, according to the interventionists, um, that's why we can um, not use the L's and use the U's uh, uh, instead. Um, so that's the... Um, uh, uh, that's the basic idea, and I think I will just uh, stop at this point. 
and open things up for questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor, uh, for your talk. Um, so um, we'll open the floor up to questions at the moment. Um, uh, if you have a question, please use the raise hand function um, at the bottom of the participant screen, and I will uh, come to you in the order that I see hands being raised. Uh, uh, so if you're not familiar with this, if you just go to the list of participants, which you can access at the bottom of your Zoom screen, uh, you should see uh, uh, at the bottom of that participant window, you should see a button saying raise hand. All right, uh, Mr. Ganesh Parikh has a question. Uh, please unmute your mic and go ahead with the question. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful lecture. Lecture, and, uh, and I am working on the problem of download causation for my thesis. Uh -huh. uh, and so, it's a very good exposition in uh, manipulation interventionist uh, theory. But um, we have this problem of mental causation actually, and when we assume a kind of a realization thesis, we end up into the square problem. So because of which uh, the question arises is downward causation, uh, specifically mental causation, qua mental variables like beliefs and uh, psychological states, or is it qua downward causation qua because of the brain states? Brain. So how can we uh, quantify or measure the psychological variables such as the beliefs and uh, other states? This would be one problem. And the other one is, if we do not accept the supervenience thesis, which other dependency relation do we accept? So these are the two questions, sir. please. OK, I'm not, let me see if I understand your question. Um, so, so what I would say that as, as long as you, one can uh, intervene on someone's beliefs, and um, change their behavior, or uh, you're, that's a legitimate case of causation. And if you intervene on the beliefs and you change some lower level variable, uh, so you know maybe I, you're afraid of something and I intervene on your beliefs and persuade you that you shouldn't be afraid, and uh, that ch changes the amount of stress hormone in your body. That would be a case of downward causation, according to me. Now, do you think there's something wrong or problematic about that? I'm not quite getting what you... It's actually, because of the realization thesis, we say that the uh, mental or the psychological states are identical with the brain states. So because, I mean, we are said to be intervening on the mental states, but are we actually intervening on the mental psychological states or the brain states because of the realization thesis this problem i think crops up so well i, I think we're so i th i think we're intervening on both and when, when i do an upper level um um uh, intervention on a, on a on a psychological state uh, that intervention will of course also change your brain state so the, the same intervention uh, affects both. Now, I was assuming in uh, my discussion um, that we are the right way to understand the relationship between uh, mental states and brain states is not uh, in terms of an identity theory, but rather uh, in terms of, you know, something like a relationship of multiple realizability or something like that, where a bunch of different brain states can realize the same uh, same mental state. Thank you. I don't, sir. That, I don't know if that responds to your question. Because the realizer will be physical as such, whichever that realizer will be. That is why the question comes about the qua problem. So the realizer is physical. So is it qua physical that the causal uh, influence is happening or qua mental that the causal efficacy is going on? So. Well, I, I, I think uh, I, I wouldn't use this uh, qua language, but I think that both um, causal relationships involving the physical variables, like the brain state variables, and causal relationships involving uh, psychological variables are present. 
So I don't think we have to choose between one or the other. I think, uh, I think both are present. So um, and maybe part of what you have in mind here is you're, you're thinking about the so-called exclusion argument Yes. Exclusion argument, and, and you're worried that if the um, there's causal uh, relations at the uh, level of uh, brain states, uh, then that sort of excludes the possibility that there are causal relations uh, involving psychological variables. But I don't accept the uh, causal exclusion argument. <laughs> I think uh, interventionism gives you a way of uh, uh, avoiding that argument or, or, or more precisely showing what's wrong with the argument. Thank you, sir. Tarun, your audio is off. Tarun, your audio is off. I'm sorry, that was my mistake. Yeah, yeah. Uh, th thanks, thanks for letting me know, Dashi. Prashanta, please go ahead with your question. Please unmute your mic, which I didn't do, and go ahead with your question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I can hear you. Uh, 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 Professor Woodward, my question is: I'm trying to understand your downward causation view. So kindly help me to see whether. Um, I am getting it or you will uh, help me how. So here's a typical case of Simpson paradox um, is like uh, we are trying to see whether the rate of recovery is high. Uh, if we give medicine, uh, we have seen if when uh, we have given medicine to men and also to women, we saw e you know, each of the cases uh, rate of recovery is high when you, uh, when you do control, but overall uh, it's the other way around that we have to, uh, uh, the, the, the rate of re, uh, recovery is high when you give the treatment. So how is the downward causation uh, and all those uh, problems will come up here or, uh, or it may not arise here? Well, so I, I see that as a very different problem than um, okay. uh, uh, issues having to do with downward causation. So, you know, you, as I take it you were describing, you, you can have a case in which um, um, a drug um, promotes recovery, um, or, or, or what, let's just say is, is correlated with um, uh, uh, recovery, uh, uh, both uh, um, in a population of men and in a population of women, but mm -hmm. um, maybe has the opposite correlation in uh, the joint uh, population that includes, uh, includes both, both men and women. Right. Um, yeah, so that's, um, that's perfectly possible, but that, I don't see that as, I, I wouldn't see that as involving um, anything that I would be inclined to call downward causation. Uh, um, I mean, what, so, okay, go ahead. Please. Well, what Simpson's paradox illustrates is simply that you um, need um, to get causal relations out of uh, correlations or probabilistic dependency relations, you need um, um, uh, causal assumptions uh, of various uh, of various sorts. Uh, so you need, um, uh, you know, in this in this particular case, um, presumably what's going on is that the uh, um, maybe a whole lot more. Uh, 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 well, there's there's some sort of additional dependency uh, among, say, the, uh, an association of some kind uh, between gender and who gets the drug, but that relationship is not a causal relationship, uh, and that w that's what messes things up. Uh, but as I say, I don't see this as uh, the same thing as the downward causation uh, example. So, so if, go ahead. Please. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, t two things. Um, is the uh, is Simpson paradox the downward causation is not working, or because the story uh, should not be causal, that's why there is no downward causation? Which one you're saying? Um, not sure you understand your 
question. Uh, uh, so the question so in, is that there in, the is this... in the Simpsons paradox case that you just described, um, if it's if it has something to do with downward causation, there has to be variables at different levels. So tell me what the different levels are you you think are uh, operating in that example. So the level is that um, uh, uh, so level is that we want to know. Uh, whether the rate of recovery uh, will be high uh, if we uh, if you give the treatment. So so the yeah. uh, variable is uh, uh, so you want to know what's the variable that is there. So basically, we men and women usually they use so there are two variables. Uh, so the rate of uh, uh, control. Uh, so we have usually the three variables uh, working on. We are want to see the co correlation between x and y. And then the Z intervenes the whole process. That means you know there's a confound going on in the problem. So you don't think it is at all a case of uh, downward causation in that way? No, 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 I don't think it is. Okay, okay. Okay, um, thanks, uh, uh, Prashanta. Uh, Jyoti, you have a question? Jyoti, are you there? Hello, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Uh, hello, so. Uh, in the when we try to when we try to attribute causal efficacy to upper level variables we take help of conditional independence now when we do this it sort of separates the two levels like the upper upper level variables and the lower level variables now uh, when we do this uh, it uh, it in fact gives a lot of arguments supporting upper level variables like the explanations that consist of upper level variables are more superior than lower level variables. Mm -hmm. So it gives an impression at first that as if, uh, like if I may say that upper level variables are like more privileged than uh, lower level variables because all the difference making capacity of lower level variables is absorbed in upper level variables. And we, can, we can't even use lower level variables for uh, like, you know, because of its tractability considerations, we cannot use it in uh, calculation. So uh, it gives an impression really like, uh, like it's not so useful. But if we take an example of, of uh, Hodgkin-Huxley model, which is a well-structured structure, which is a well-structured, uh, which is a supported causal structure, like empirically. So, uh, so I want to understand that, should we just take it like, this is the role that lower level plays that uh, it, sort of help, it sort of helps in realizing the upper level variables. And, and that is it. It's mostly the upper level variables that, uh, that is uh, more uh, pragmatic and superior. And that's how the world is. Or there is something more to <laughs> the way lower level variables like work or can help in understanding. Mm -hmm. Okay. or contributes okay um good question and 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 this is something that i didn't really uh say a whole lot about it, uh, in the talk so there, there are two possible if you if you think that there's such a thing as downward causation uh there are two possible views that you might have one is uh, what might be described as downward exclusion and here the idea would be that the, the upper level variables are actually um, better. And when the upper level variables are causally efficacious, that means that the lower level variables are not. Okay. Um, and, and in fact, people have defended uh, views like this uh, in the literature. So uh, Christian Litz and uh, the late um, uh, Peter Menzies, um, uh, uh, have written papers defending this view. This is not my view. I don't think that the um, upper level, the, the presence of causal relations involving upper level variables means that causal relations involving the lower level variables aren't there. Okay, I, I think there are causal relations involving the lower level variables are present and causal relations involving the upper level variables are present. So I don't see I don't endorse this kind of downward uh, uh, exclusion point of view. Now, what I think is true, and here I, I'm gonna pick up on uh, something you said, that in a whole lot of cases, um, we don't 
we either don't have access to the lower level variables or to the extent that we do, if we were trying to incorporate them in a model, it would become overwhelmingly computationally complex. And therefore, uh, it's fortunate that at least in a lot of cases, we can just use the upper level variables because they um, absorb all of the difference making features that we're interested in. So the picture that I have is that, you know, you know what's going on, so to speak, in the world is that there are causal relations at all sorts of different levels. Uh, from the point of view of modeling things or explaining things, the lower level stuff is often so complicated that we really can't model it or capture it very well. And so we uh, use uh, the upper level uh, uh, variables uh, in, instead. So you have this, in other words, the um, what I, that relationship that I call conditional uh, independence, um, that's in effect what allows us to uh, employ computational and modeling strategies that uh, don't trace all of the gory detail that's going on at, uh, at, the, at the lower level. I don't know whether that uh, yeah. answers your question. Yes, yes, it does. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jyoti. Um, uh, Mr. Prakash Thanabal has a question. Please go ahead. Are you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hello. Hello. Can you yeah. hear me? We can hear you, yeah. Thank, thank, thank you so much, Professor Woodward. Thank you so much for your lecture. Like, um, so my understanding of your thesis is that uh, the conditional independence, uh, you're proposing it as a sufficient uh, a requirement uh, to justify uh, the presence of a downward causation model? Would that be the case? Yeah, let, let's, um, I, I think there are some complications, but let's stipulate that that's my view for present, purposes of present discussion. Okay, and then my question is that uh, uh, in, in the case of uh, the causal cycles, uh, you, you had you had given us two uh, particular scenarios. One is the idea of the causal cycle, where there is some kind of a feedback mechanism. So right. I'm I'm concerned that uh, especially when you use the, uh, the when when you describe this conditional independence as being complete, when you say it's completely, uh, you know, there's a complete uh, uh, independence, uh, then how do you decide on the direction? Of causation, like how how do you justify whether that is going to be downward or upward? That is well, my uh, yeah yeah I, I think it's both. <laughs> okay. So in the case of the Hodgkin Huxley model, the um, the voltage across the membrane uh, causally influences the behavior of the ion channels. Okay. But then the behavior of the ion, and so that's from upper to lower. But then the behavior of the ion channels causally influences the, um, uh, the, the voltage across the membrane because as the current, um, as current flows across the membrane, that, that changes the potential difference across the membrane. So would, so. The, would the conditioning direction also change? For example, in the downward causation, the conditioning is on the up, uh, U variables, that's the upper variables. So so is there the, the possibility then you're talking about in the, in the cycle, when, when you talk about the ionic conductance, uh, explaining the um, uh, voltage, the membrane, then you are conditioning on the lower variable. Is that, does it go along like that? I mean, I'm wondering what, what, what. Well, when you, when you, in, in this sort of case, you're, you're um, changing what the effect variable is. So, First of all, you're um, saying that the, uh, um, the um, uh, conductances uh, in the channels uh, causally affect the uh, voltage. And what that would mean would be something like um, conditional on even lower level variables, like behavior of individual molecules, um, 
the, the behavior of those individual molecules is going to be conditionally independent of the voltage, conditional on the um, uh, conductances across the membrane. Okay, that makes the con that shows the conductances across the membrane are um, uh, difference-making variables for the voltage. Uh, but then um, going in the other direction, um, if you have um, lower-level variables characterizing uh, 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 the membrane, right. um, conditional on the uh, voltage across uh, the membrane, those lower-level variables become independent of the um, uh, of the uh, conductance across the membrane. So the the direction. Um, the, the shift in direction, so to speak, comes about because you're you're looking at different effects, and you're applying the um, conditional independence idea to different uh, different effects. In the one case, the uh, conductance, and in the other case, uh, uh, the voltage across the membrane. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Darshi. Uh, you have a question. Hi, uh, yes, yes, yes. The only reason I could detect Tarun was because I have been uh, had enough red wine to increase my HDL. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I hope I can put forth this question properly. Uh, uh, okay, maybe not your main argument, but I think at least a subsidiary argument is that uh, you know X uh, is. Um, Downwardly causes Y, it means that X is causally supervenient over Y. And now the uh, you practice the principle of charity. I, I take it to say that if we have con conditional independence, then it is in principle possible that Y is supervenient on X. I think this is, uh, I, I've more or less quoted you. But I'm not, I'm not so sure how this can be because you have said that the the uh, downward causation is a subjective subjective function from y to x. Now the inverse function, as I see it, can at best be a subset of x being injective on y. Okay, so so uh, so I don't see how. You know, X would uh, sorry, Y would ever be causally supervenient on X. At best, it will be, if I can use the term, equi <laughs> Okay. So, uh, in case it is injective and the subset, for some reason, the subset of Y collapses to to X. But the, you know, I, that also I don't think uh, to be very likely. So, so I, I don't see, even though you allow for being in, in principle, in principle uh, supervenient, I don't see how it would be. If, if I'm reading the, the, the idea of projective function correctly. Well, so I, I mean, there, so there, there are several things you need to distinguish. So first of all, you, you've got the question, you, you've got a, a, a candidate for a cause X, okay? And you've got, um, a possible effect y okay and then you've got let's say um some lower level variable that realizes uh x okay call that z i'm not claiming that there's any kind of causal relationship between x and z i see that as a non-causal relationship the causal relationship uh, if there is one is is from um uh, uh x to y Okay, so the, um, I don't know if that responds to your question, but the, the um, my, my the, mother, yeah. the question of what the relationship is between X and its realizer uh, is different from uh, the question of what the relationship is between X and its putative um, uh, uh, effect Y. And so when I talked about that functional relationship, um, that was meant to characterize the relationship between uh, X and its realizer. At least if I remember correctly what I was talking about. It's been a while since I've reviewed that paper. Okay. May I, uh, maybe I haven't gotten it, but my point is basically supporting your thesis because I don't see how the inverse function can ever be subjective. That, uh, in, in, so, so I don't see why even in principle 
that why could ever be super brilliant over it? That's my question. Maybe I'll email you to explain it. Yeah, well, again, I would, I would just say I think we need to distinguish yeah. the, um, so the relationship between X and what it supervenes on, yeah. Yeah. that's not meant to be causal, at least in my... Okay, uh, okay, okay. Okay, okay. And I, uh, I think I... Uh, okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thanks, Dashi. Uh, so I do not currently see any hands raised, so I'll take this opportunity to ask a question myself. Um, this was so, um, I think when, when you described uh, conditional uh, independence as being uh, the condition one should be looking for uh, when you want to uh, uh, talk about the variables being sufficiently distinct, um, I'm wondering if that is too strong, that even the weaker versions of conditional independence that you described might be too strong. Uh, so I think there are a lot of examples in say like statistical physics and so on, where your higher level variable gives you some kind of stable predictability about the statistical properties of some other variable, right? Um, and so in some sense, the statistical properties of the variable, uh, you can explain or you can, can kind of manipulate fairly easily using the higher level variable. Um, but it would still be the case that being able to have more fine-grained ability to manipulate the lower level realizers of that high level variable might uh, I, I mean, radically change those statistical problems. It just so happens that the way the lower, because of some randomness assumption, the way the lower level realizers shake out in the real world, uh, they don't have that, uh, mm -hmm. that effect. But if one could actually go in and change the variables around and, and manipulate the variables at the lower level, you could kind of radically change the statistical properties of the outcome of interest, right? Yeah, I think that's uh, right, if I've underst understood your question. Um, so the, um, in, 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 the, uh, in, in, in the statistical mechanical case, um, and, and thinking about the relationship between statistical mechanics and upper level thermodynamic variables, um, the uh, can something like the conditional independence uh, relationship holds for all except a set of measure zero or something like that. So it doesn't hold. Um, so there are very unusual configurations of uh, 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 the molecules such that if you were to realize them, either experimentally or maybe they just happen uh, to be realized, you would get um, uh, violations of the uh, uh, of thermodynamic relations, but those are... Uh, no, so I wasn't specific, so that was kind of covered in one of the, one of the uh, definitions you gave later, where you said almost all, um, it could yeah. just be almost all. So, so that I got, I mean, maybe I'm suggesting something slightly different. Maybe, maybe it doesn't make sense. So, so what I'm thinking of here is a case where um, because there is some kind of randomizing process, assume, let's assume there's some kind of process that ensures a certain kind of statistical pro property holds at the lower level, right? That uh, some kind, whatever, you know, the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution or something, holds at the lower level. Um, but, and so because of that, then assuming that that distribution holds, there's a certain kind of uh, control you can have at the higher level or something like this, right? Um, so I'm saying that assuming a certain kind of underlying randomness assumption holds, there's, a, there's control you have at the high, at, there's predictable control you have at the up, higher level. Um, but right. you can go in and violate that assumption, which doesn't need to be moving things to a set of measure zero or something like this. It could be um, uh, just changing the statistical structure of the system. Um, then you no longer have that control at the upper level, right? That's yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I mean, I, so what I think is true um, in the kind of case you describe is for almost all, um, kind of reasonably behaved um, uh, distributions, 
uh, over, say, the molecular uh, velocities and, and momenta um, that, that satisfy uh, the thermodynamic constraints, you're going to get the, um, you know, the uh, usual uh, 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 thermodynamic effects. So it isn't as though um, if you, you know, if you, if you, it isn't as though if you change um, the, uh, the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution just a tiny little bit, you're going to get violations of the, uh, you, you know, you're going to get really unusual behavior. The, 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 the set in which it, you, for which that's going to be true is, is going to be, it's going to involve probability distributions that are, you know, in some way very, very special. Uh, okay. Is that's my, uh, that's my assumption here. Now, not, but not, now you're quite right. You can do this, uh, though, in, pr in principle. I mean, that's, I guess, what Maxwell's demon is all about, mm -hmm. right? So right. if you, in, in manip you, know, you can manipulate individual molecules in such a way that you can, you know, produce a uh, anti entropic behavior. Uh, so, so, yeah, that's possible. Um, I, I, yes, that's, that's, an, that's an interesting point that I hadn't really thought about as much as I probably should. So, you, you're, you know, maybe what I'm assuming here is some sort of, um, you're, there has to be some sort of assumption about um, uh, what the distribution is over the um, uh, lower level variables for this to work. Is that what you're right. getting well, at? I, I, so let me just make one more attempt at, at getting this across. I think I think it's a little bit different even from that point. So uh, so so here's here's kind of the, the, the what I'm thinking about, right? So let's imagine that one can precisely set the value of some value of some variable y by precisely setting the values of the lower level variables, right? So if I precisely set the values of the lower level variables, I can set a precise value for y. But what I can do at the upper level is I can, uh, this is not set a precise value of y by adjusting the, up, the, the value, but I can, I can make predictable changes to certain statistical properties of y by twiddling a dial at the upper level. Right? And this seems like something that happens fairly often, that the co-strain control we have is over the statistical properties of a system. Whereas if we had unlimited fine grade control, we would have precise control over the properties of the system. And so that doesn't seem like a case where you have independence of the time type you're talking of, yet it seems like a case where one wants to talk about downward causation often, right? Okay, um, yeah, I'll have to think about that. So, so basically what you're talking about is a case in which um, the, uh, the effect uh, of interest is something like uh, a probability distribution. And that's what you're manipulating. Yeah. Right. Yeah, or, or yeah, what you, what you manipulate is the probability distribution of the effect variable. But, but you can also, yeah. if you add fine grained control. That in effect means that the, that the effect is a probability distribution. Right. Oh, sure. Yeah, 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 all right, yeah. The way I would see it. And, and so, um, so, so the, um, I mean, would you agree that the, um, so, so I'm manipulating the probability distribution by manipulating some upper level variable. Right. And the, the upper level variable might satisfy my conditional independence relation with respect to that probability distribution, right? Even though um, I can, if I wasn't interested in manipulating the probability no, no, because if I had fine grain control, I could effectively change every probability distribution to a delta function, right? I could set precise values for the for the for the variable of interest. Um, so even conditionalizing on whatever the 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 um, higher level thing is, I can by by changing around the the precise values of the lower level variables, I can effectively change the probability distribution at least from an epistemic uh -huh. to a delta function. Okay, I know exactly what the deterministically the outcome is going to be. So. Um, hmm. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I have, I'll, have to, I'll have to think about that uh, a bit more. Of course, 
when you're manipulating the, the lower level variables uh, in this way, you have to, it's part of my uh, requirement to have to do it in a way that's consistent with uh, the values of the upper level variables, right? Right, right. right. okay. Uh, yeah, but that, that, that doesn't seem like it's, I mean, that seems like it's possible, right, in this case. So it's, it's just each realizer would be a different delta function at the lower level, each realizer of this upper level. At the, at the would, upper level, it's a smooth, smooth probability function. That's what I'm controlling. But then each realizer of a particular upper level setting is a, corresponds to a specific delta function for the effect variable. Uh-huh. Yeah. So the, the um, okay, so, so I'm, uh, and, and, and the aggregate impact of those, uh, Delta functions is a uh, uh, um, whatever. Um, well, not the aggregate, sort of the epistemic, so not knowing which of those delta functions is the actual case gives us a smooth probability distribution. That's the. So there's the not having the knowledge about the precise details of the un, right? That's, um, yeah, I'll have, I guess I'll just have to. Th uh, I'll have to think about that a little, uh, 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 a little more. Um, yeah. So, do you think this generalizes? So, so this is a. Uh, I mean, the suggestion you're making is in the context of uh, statistical mechanics. Uh, what about other cases of um, putative downward causation, like my monkey case, uh, for example? Yeah, I don't know if it, I mean, when you aren't, you don't have kind of this, so it doesn't sound like there what you're doing is controlling a probability distribution at the upper level. Or that's yeah. not, yeah, so, so maybe this kind of analysis wouldn't work there. But, yeah. but I, I'm not very familiar with that area of science, so I wouldn't know. Yeah. Okay, well, that's a very good question. I guess I, I really need to. Uh, uh, uh -huh. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so maybe yeah, there's other people who have questions. Let me move. Don has a question. Uh, Don, would you like to ask? Yeah. Yes. Uh, my question is just uh, uh, to ask you to clarify your uh, example of downward causation in biology, uh, because in your paper uh, you mentioned that I mean you give this um, scenario of um, coarse level uh, coarse grained. Uh, description of variables which are you know, relevant for explaining um, organism behavior, uh, where organism behavior would be you know, irrelevant to uh, the fine grain details at the molecular level. But in this case, it seems like uh, uh, the, the level at which we talk about uh, the coarse grained description uh, is at the same level of organism behavior. So if you're talking about the causal uh, causal relation, it is uh, uh, the coarse grain variables causally, uh, are causally relevant to the uh, behavior that we want to explain. Uh, so is this a case of uh, downward causation? I, I couldn't uh, quite Okay, so, so some of the examples, including the, uh, uh, some of the examples that I talk about, you, you, you have causation uh, affecting an upper level um, you, you have a causation from an upper level variable to say the behavior of the whole organism and you might say those two things are at the same level but in other cases um the um what's being affected is you know something that is a, uh, intuitively at a considerably lower mm -hmm. level the, um, you know in, the, in, the, in my case with the uh, manipulating the position of the uh, uh, chimpanzee within the uh, 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 the social hierarchy um that seems like a pretty high level variable position in the social hierarchy. And um, the effect is something like serotonin levels, which seems that, like it's at a much lower level. So that does seem to me to be downward causation. The, um, and, I mean, another illustration might be some environmental uh, event or events that uh, impose a high le level of uh, stress uh, on the organism and so cortisol levels uh, 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 go up a whole lot uh, 
uh, in the organism. Now, presumably in that kind of case, the precise details at say a molecular level of how the stressful um, episode in the environment is realized, that doesn't matter, right? As long as there's a stress or threat or something like that, uh, you're gonna get this um, same reaction in terms of the, uh, the cortisol uh, uh, changes. That's the, that's the kind of picture that I had. In fact, you would, you know, just from the point of view of thinking about from natural selection, of course you don't, um, if, if, if the um, response of increased uh, cortisol levels is adaptive, uh, of course you don't want whether the response occurs or not to depend upon a precise realization of the uh, stressful event. As long as there's something stressful or threatening, uh, you wanna have that physiological reaction. That's why I say that in the, um, uh, I think in a lot of biological examples, something close to the uh, condition that I described uh, uh, is realized. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks, Don. Uh, Darshi has another question. Darshi, go ahead. Okay, it's uh, more of a general question uh, from an outsider. <laughs> uh, that is, uh, is it that the higher levels are somehow uh, more structurally general uh, that, uh, you know, in order for the uh, downward ca causation to work. I mean, I, if I think of an analog in mathematics, of course, we're not talking about causal relation there, something else, maybe proofs, uh, is that, you know, like a topology might be supervenient over geometry because it is uh, it a, a greater structural generality than, you know, but in mathematics, we have the other way also. We have the al algebraization of geometry, and then we have the algebraization of logic. So, so, so there's a, both the logicist and the anti-logicist kind of programs, uh, you know, are both being uh, supported in the history of mathematics. So, uh, uh, so is, is there something like that, a greater structure generality that is involved? In well, yeah, I, I think often the upper level variables will, I mean, because of the, you know, the multiple realizability relation, um, they're going to apply to a wider, wider range of cases, right? Um, so on the one hand, you've got supposedly a, 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 you know, maybe some very, very specific profile of uh, uh, facts about the position and momentum of a collection of molecules. Um, that's going to be realized only, <laughs> you know, you know, maybe only once in the entire history of this uh, particular uh, uh, sample of gas. On the other hand, um, if, if, if this is a, a realizer for, say, a certain temperature, um, uh, the temperature is going to, you know, something that, will, uh, you know, maybe if the if it's thermally isolated, it's going to be. Uh, realized, uh, you know, over time by lots of different uh, uh, molecular profiles. So, so yes, the, the, um, uh, the, the upper level stuff is, is often in some sense more general or applies to a, a wider variety of cases. And, and that, of course, is, uh, you know, that, that's another thing about the upper level stuff that makes it, you know, maybe, it may be more useful uh, for a lot of different purposes. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, do, do you want to have, no, Okay. Thanks, Dashi. Um, uh, Ganesh has typed a question in the chat. He says, could you please state whether the down, whether downward causation according to the intervention model of causation is epistemic or ontological? It's ontological. Whatever that means. <laughs> okay. All right. Sorry, enough. Ganesh, uh, does that satisfy you or do you want to follow up on that question? Just yeah. Oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, uh, in one sense, because uh, in some part of your paper, sir, you have written on this epistemic and computational tractability. And uh, uh, one more reason being that when, we are, uh, when, he, when you are talking about variables and degrees of freedom, so at one place you said that, uh, for example, three dimensions of positions and three dimensions of momentum, for instance, they collapse when we mention one higher level variable. 
so they can be so the higher level variable can it be analytically reduced to the lower level variables and then we can call it a distributed causality rather than top down causality or downward causation as such so i mean am i asking the right question in the first place um i'm not entirely sure you said you you asking a question about reduction in power whether they uh, yes sir yes the reduction in the sense when you said that uh, the lower level degrees of freedom they collapse into one when we mention the higher level variables so the right. lower level degrees of freedom can be considered as variables at the lower level but when we talk about the higher level variable all these lower level variables collapse into one so yeah. the question that i am asking is the higher level variable it can be analytically reduced or it is composed of the lower level variables and so we can call it as a distributed causation and we don't need to bring in the contested concept of uh, top down causation or downward causation and that is why i was uh, concerned whether it is a epistemic uh, uh, way of understanding downward causation or a ontological way of it well i so so the way i understand this uh, conditional independence relation it's a it's a relation that is there or not in the world okay it, it isn't just um that we find it convenient to think in terms of that relation okay. although we do find it convenient to think in terms of that relation but it's a, it's a it's a feature of the world of that that uh independence or something close to it um uh, uh obtains that so that's how i'm think, thinking about that now with regard to your um question about reduction um in the um at least in the kinds of simple cases that i was describing i i think you can uh um um do carry out something like a, uh an analytical reduction so the you know you 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 can uh, average over the kinetic energies of all of the molecules and uh uh to um uh define a notion of uh, temperature now it has to there there are other the notion of temperature to be well defined other things have to be true like the, the gases and uh uh equilibrium and that doesn't seem to be a feature of the uh, uh that that doesn't seem to be a property of any individual uh like uh, but you can you you can do something so in that kind of case you can uh um i mean i think it, yeah in principle you can uh you can do that but i so so when you say that the causation is distributed i i'm not exactly sure what you mean uh maybe you can explain that a little more <laughs> distributed in the sense that we can reduce it when we or we can aggregate over the analytically reduced uh single variables at the lower level yeah okay okay i guess i'm happy happy with that uh, okay sir so i mean these upper level variables are in some sense representations of the uh aggregate impact of uh, uh a lot of uh, uh a lot of lower level variables i don't see how one can uh i don't see how one can deny that <laughs> yes yes so, um okay uh, thanks uh, ganesh uh, uh don has another question please go ahead don ha huh, yes uh, professor woodward um since you uh, mentioned pearl um and also uh, spiders glimmer and shinies um in the causal modeling um um you know literature um i mean i mean have you do you have any papers or do you know of any people who have tried to uh, represent downward causal relations in a directed acyclic graph uh, because there i mean i would assume that using the uh, notion of conditional independence you could come up with some constraints as to how you would represent causal relations in a graph uh, but i was just wondering whether you would uh, have something to say about it um so i i don't know of anything that is 
directly uh, uh, on that topic. Um, a paper, or actually a couple of papers that I will recommend to you are um, to uh, Frederick Eberhardt, uh, E-B-E-R-H-A-R-D-T. Um, he's at um, uh, Caltech now. Uh, he's, he's a, uh, he, he was trained though at uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon. And what he has, he's interested in the following um, relatively specific problem. He's working with um, some uh, neuro, neurobiologists on the problem. Um, suppose that you um, have a, uh, you, you're presenting a, a, an animal, say, with a, with a certain visual image. And um, you have a pixel by pixel representation of the image. So you have a very fine grained representation of the image. Um, the animal, of course, is presumably not responding. That there's, the animal is responding to higher level features of the um, uh, pixel by pixel representation, right? Uh, you know, like whether it's uh, a dog or a triangle or, or, uh, or something like that. Um, so the question is, is there some way just by looking at the animal's responses to a various um, pixel um, by pixel uh, representations to extract what the higher level features are that the animal is responding to? And that's a kind of causal discovery um, problem. And uh, what Eberhardt does is he uses um, um, stuff in the uh, Spurdy's Gleamore Shina's tradition and the Pearl tradition to um, actually give you a, 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 a well, really an algorithm that, that uh, uh, addresses that uh, causal discovery problem. So that, that would be, that's somebody who's tr tried to do that. And if you look at what the, um, what the algorithm does, uh, basically what it's doing is discovering the, you know, something like the kinds of conditional independence relations that I was, that I was talking about. So that's, that's a study in a, in a formal uh, setting. Um, another um, uh, example that in which this has been done is uh, 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 climate modeling, uh, where um, uh, Lemore and uh, some others, and their papers probably on Clark's uh, uh, website. Um, of course, with climate modeling, you also have you have the following problem: you you have these um, uh, measurement devices that are all over the world that are measuring, say, what the local ocean temperature is or what the local barometric pressure is. And you've got a, just a huge amount of um, data coming in from these different measurement devices. Um, but what you want to do is to somehow aggregate that da data in such a way that you can extract higher level patterns, right? I mean, the data itself is like, overwhelmingly complex and if you're just staring at the data that's not very useful. What you're wondering is whether there are higher level patterns in the data. And um, so, so they've uh, actually used the uh, causal uh, discovery algorithms they have to try to find uh, upper level patterns. And it turns out that uh, this, uh, when they use these causal discovery algorithms, they do reproduce um, something close to um, a lot of what the standard climate models say. Um, that is, the, you know, they identify things like, um, you know, well, I can't remember the details, but, you know, maybe they'll identify a, a, an El Nino type event as an important uh, uh, event or something, or something like that. So, so that would be another thing you might look at. Uh, so there, there is, a, I mean, this, 
this does core what I've been talking about does correspond to like a real uh, uh, important set of real life um, uh, scientific problems in which you have a whole lot of uh, maybe overwhelmingly uh, a lot of uh, lower level um, uh, data and what you're trying to do is to find um, sort of stable upper level patterns that might represent causal relationships that you can extract from that data. So this is something that people, certainly something that people are working on and, uh, and, and who are interested in machine learning of uh, uh, causal relations. Um, um, applying this, uh, the same sort of problem arises in connection with uh, uh, imaging data in uh, neurobiology. So if you have um, a whole lot of fMRI data, which also might be, you know, at a sort of pixel type uh, 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 level. And what you want to do is to somehow extract from that, um, you know, causal relationships involving, uh, you know, much larger uh, uh, neural areas, or you want to identify uh, uh, sort of functional uh, 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 causal relationships within within the brain. It's the same. It's the same kind of problem. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks. Um, so uh, again, I think uh, there's no more hands up at the moment. So uh, I, I, I'd like to ask one more question, which is kind of related to the previous question I asked, or maybe. It's just a thought, and, and I'd like to hear what you think about this. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking about what I think is different between the kinds of cases I was trying to describe, maybe not very successfully earlier, and uh, some of the cases that you use as an example. And I think that maybe, um, so, so the kind of examples that you are, you, seem, you are using, the ones that come from biology or uh, um, psychology and so on, um, the there's a kind the 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 relevant really there's a kind of part whole relationship between the levels right so you have um the whole and it can potentially be multiply re realized so uh, but in at least statistical physics and maybe this is true in other domains as well um there are certain properties which we think of as upper level properties but their upper levelness is not due to some aggregation of lower level properties they, so the natural way, at least the way I think most statistical physicists think about uh, properties like entropy, for example, is that they're not proper, they're properties of ensembles. Even though they're attributed to individual systems, they're properties on, of ensembles of systems, right? So it's not that, you know, one particular arrangement of molecules, if you get large enough, is going to give you a particular entropy. If it's a specific arrangement of molecules, it has entropy zero, right? It definitely has entropy zero. You only have non-zero entropy when you don't have one specific arrangement of molecules, when you, a, when you have an ensemble of arrangements of molecules, where you have a distribution, which is like a theoretical entity. It's not, you don't have the distribution in the, in the real world. So it's not a part-whole relationship in the ordinary sense. Um, and I think that is where maybe some of the concerns I was raising earlier come up. And you have to think about downward causation involving those kinds of statistical variables like entropy. Mm, interesting. So do you think the same thing is, I mean, what you say about entropy seems very plausible. Um, do you think the same thing is true for temperature? Well, temperature is a, I think it's a tricky thing because I mean, the, the, the standard way people think about temperature is mean molecular kinetic energy. And that just seems like a straightforward part whole thing where you can, but I mean, that is really just uh, true for one particular kind of system, right? It's only true for ideal gases. The more universal notion of temperature in uh, statistical mechanics is actually, I think, a lot closer to entropy. It's a, it's a property of ensembles. It just so happens to be the case that for the case of ideal gases, we have this very neat way of thinking about temperature that doesn't require us to think about ensembles, probably because Boltzmann didn't think in terms of ensembles. So he, he, but, uh, but yeah, mean molecular kinetic energy is obviously not an ensemble property. That's just a property of a system, a single system. But, uh, yeah. but I don't think that is what temperature really is in statistical physics. Okay. Okay. Now that so that's an interesting uh, 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 suggestion. I mean, so entropy. I, I mean, what it kind of brings um, 
something like a notion of possibility into the uh, right. picture, right? Where, where, where the, basically the thinking in terms of ensembles is a way of uh, capturing that, uh, right. you know, possible states that the system, that, a, that an individual system might be in. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, that's interesting. So maybe I, I, I maybe I am trading too heavily on the uh, statistical uh, 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 physics kinds of examples. I, I just uh, use them because you know partly they're so familiar to philosophers of science. But uh, right. so that's uh, I'll have to think more about that. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, any other questions? Anyone have? Okay. I think we are done. Unless I'm missing somebody. Yeah. Okay, uh, so thank you very much, uh, Professor Woodward. That was a really lovely talk and a great discussion. And thanks for being here despite uh, early in the morning your time and uh, being patient with us and spending so much time with us. Uh, that was a very useful uh, discussion for all of us, I'm sure. Um, well, so well, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you very much for uh, your questions. I know that it's uh, just as though it's relatively early in the morning for me. I know it's later on in the evening for you. And, uh, so right. I'm yeah. grateful. Well, the talk has been sufficiently invigorating that uh, I think that hasn't affected any of us. But uh, so thank, thank you all also for uh, attending. Thank you all for being here. And thank uh, you, sir, yeah, for yeah. arranging and all. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're welcome. Yeah. And um, I hope you will all also join us next week or, and the, we, as the series continues. Uh, next week, we have uh, Professor Heather Douglas who will be joining us uh, at 6 p.m. Uh, Indian time. Um, all right. Um, so, yeah, thank you all for coming. Thank you, uh, especially Professor Woodward, uh, for joining us and giving such a great talk. And I'll see at least hopefully some of you next week. Thanks. Okay. Well, nice to meet all of you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thanks.